This year marks the 30th anniversary of formal relations between South Korea and ASEAN, a political and economic community of 10 Southeast Asian countries. To celebrate the occasion, the ASEAN-Korea Commemorative Summit will be held in Busan from November 25th to the 26th. The summit will be the third of its kind to be held in South Korea after the first in 2009 and the second one in 2014. During the first summit, which was held in Jeju in 2009 to mark 20 years of friendly ties, South Korea and ASEAN signed an investment agreement of the ASEAN-South Korea Free Trade Agreement to strengthen economic cooperation. They also adopted a joint statement where the leaders expressed concerns for North Korea's nuclear issue, a first for ASEAN member states. The second summit took place in Busan in 2014, in time for the 25th anniversary of ASEAN-Korea Dialogue Partnership. The summit produced a joint statement on the future vision of the ASEAN-Korea Strategic Partnership, which called for increased cooperation in the political, security, economic, and social cultural spheres. It also led to the creation of the ASEAN-Korea Business Council. The upcoming ASEAN-Korea Commemorative Summit is expected to bring together the heads of state, business leaders, and press from 10 ASEAN members. It will be an opportunity to present a vision for the next 30 years of ASEAN-Korea relations and shore up support from ASEAN for Seoul's Peace Drive. On today's special episode of Peace and Prosperity on the ASEAN-Korea Commemorative Summit, we go in-depth into the significance of ASEAN and the need for multilateral diplomacy. Our host, Pung Young-sik Research Fellow at Yonsei University's Institute for North Korean Studies, is joined by Kim hyung jong Professor of International Relations at Yonsei University. To broaden the perspective, we also connect with guest experts on Skype, including Kanti Prasad Bajpai, Professor of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore and Ramon Pacheco Pardo, Associate Professor of International Relations at King's College, London. Hello and welcome to our program. The leaders of 10 ASEAN countries will sit down in Busan next week to discuss their diplomatic and economic cooperation with South Korea. On this week's episode of Peace and Prosperity, we'll take a deep dive into the importance and potential of ASEAN on the diplomatic and economic front. Joining with us is a renowned ASEAN expert in Korea, Professor Kim Young jong from the Department of International Relations at Yonsei University. Thanks for coming to the studio. Thank Professor you for having Kim. me. Right. So ASEAN is coming to uh, Busan in South Korea and tell, tell us a little bit about the significance of ASEAN in general. Right. Uh, the ASEAN has increasingly become an important partner for many countries for several reasons. First thing is that ASEAN itself has to transform into the ASEAN community mm -hmm. in 2015, the consisting of the three pillars, namely political securities, economy, and social cultural community. Mm -hmm. In particular, the ASEAN economic community uh, has created a single market and single production base, which is attractive for the foreign investments and then trade and so on. So ASEAN has a huge population, mm -hmm. over 600, uh, 650 million, mm -hmm. right? So uh, in that sense, so many countries uh, are rushed to the, uh, the ASEAN's cooperation. And second thing is that ASEAN uh, has played a very important role in promoting and developing the East Asia regionalism. In the aftermath of the economic crisis, as ASEAN the, uh, has contributed to that, uh, the forming the ASEAN Plus 3 and East Asia Summit and so on. So during that the regional cooperation, as ASEAN has proved that it's the uh, capability of being leaders of the regional cooperation. I see. And you have written a lot of uh, uh, important articles and uh, uh, academic pieces on ASEAN. And uh, tell us a little bit more about the specific aspects of so-called ASEAN way that you so, emphasize in your writing. Right. The ASEAN way, actually, there's no the consensus on the definition of the ASEAN way, okay. but uh, rather refer that very unique way of the doing business. So namely, the first thing is the, the very unique the way of the decision-making process. So that means is always based on the consultation and the consensus. Consultation so, and consensus. Right. Yeah. So it, 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 it read that the, then all members participate in the decision-making process with the equal right and opportunities. Mm -hmm. 
So second thing is that the informality. So uh, based on the informality, uh, they can promote uh, such kind of the uh, dialogues. And so dialogue, having dialogue itself becomes their purpose of the, mm -hmm. the negotiation. So it provides them uh, a kind of the opportunity to deal with the very sensitive issues uh, without uh, uh, hurting their heart and then the face. Mm. So uh, consultation and consensus and uh, informal ways of doing dialogue and diplomatic engagement. Right. Yeah. ASEAN. Right. Very interesting. Mm. ASEAN is South Korea's second largest trading partner following China. This year marks the 30th anniversary of South Korea-ASEAN ties. We look back at how their relationship has evolved over the last three decades. ASEAN was launched in August 1967 with five member states. It was not until the early 1980s that South Korea first established ties with ASEAN. But they were limited to bilateral diplomacy with individual member states. After Seoul's successful hosting of the 1986 Asian Games and the 1988 Summer Olympics, which enhanced South Korea's standing in the international community, the country was recognized as ASEAN's sectoral dialogue partner in November 1989. South Korea became a full dialogue partner in 1991, joining the ranks of the U.S. and Japan. The elevated status led to full-fledged cooperation between South Korea and ASEAN. The first and second ASEAN-Korea commemorative summits were held, and South Korea opened its mission to ASEAN to further strengthen the partnership. Meanwhile, ASEAN has become South Korea's second largest trading partner after China. The Moon Jae-in administration's new Southern policy has opened a new era of partnership between South Korea and ASEAN. South Korea's trade with ASEAN reached 160 billion U.S. dollars in 2018. And the number of tourists between the two sides grew nearly twofold, from 6.7 million to 11 million from 2014 to 2018. Hoping to keep the momentum strong, Seoul has set a goal to increase South Korea's bilateral trade with ASEAN to $200 billion and the number of travelers to 15 million in the year 2020. Expectations are high for South Korea's ambitious plan and its potential impact. Well, as the VCL indicates, it seems like sky is the only limit for the upward potential for ASEAN to growth. Uh, but what specific potentials would you like to highlight among them? Right. Actually, the, between the ASEAN and Korea, there's a very strong the economic cooperation the, through that the so-called production network the, mm -hmm. in production. traditional manufacturing sectors. But between, beside that, uh, I think there's the emerging sectors the, for the potential the cooperation between the two, uh, which may include that the, the, the first the industrial revolutions mm -hmm. and the smart cities and so on. For example, the last year the, under the Singapore the chairmanship, so ASEAN has agreed to have the, a kind of the network of the smart cities the, with the smart, city. uh, smart cities mm -hmm. with the external partnership, including US and Korea and so on. So uh, probably the, thanks to the, the development of the ITs and technologies, I think there's been more and the potential the sectors for the economic mm -hmm. cooperation between the two. Mm -hmm. We will connect with an expert based in Singapore, one of the ASEAN member states, to hear his observations. We have on the line Professor Kanti Prasad Baspai from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. Welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. I'm very pleased to, to be on it. Uh, greetings from Singapore, uh, from the National University of Singapore and the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy where I teach. Uh, you're so welcome, Professor. Uh, my first question is regarding the South Korea's image or the image of South Korean businesses perceived in Singapore. What makes South Korea a key economic partner for Singapore? Well, I think the first and very important thing is that there's uh, great admiration for South Korean businesses and companies here in Singapore. Admiration for them being global players, for being leading technological innovators, uh, for really having taken South Korea from a developing country uh, to a developed country. And uh, so I think that's the first thing. And I think uh, in addition, of course, there's great respect for the quality of Singapore, uh, I'm sorry, of South Korean products in Singapore. So 
uh, you know, it's it's a very authentic kind of uh, admiration for for South Korean businesses, and so that's that's been there for a very long time. I think secondly, of course, the uh, the bilateral trade relationship is very important. It's now in the region of 45 billion dollars per year, uh, and that's pretty healthy. Uh, in addition, um, there's a good investment relationship between the two countries. So. Uh, roughly 50 major Singapore businesses uh, are, have invested and in, operate in, in South Korea. So I think this is very important. The two sides signed a free trade uh, agreement back in 2005. Uh, this was reaffirmed in 2018 uh, with new areas of cooperation, including reducing tariffs. And I think the last thing to say probably here on, on trade and the economic relationship is that um, very recently, uh, you'll recall that the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP, was signed. And of course, uh, South Korea is a very important part of that, and so is Singapore. So they're linked yet again uh, uh, amongst many other associations and agreements uh, that are multilateral. Well, if I uh, uh, ask you more specific questions, in what area is the bilateral exchange between South Korea and Singapore most uh, active? How big is the growth potential in that area? Well, that's an interesting question because I think everyone's focused on trade and investment as I was just a couple of minutes ago. But in fact, if you look at the relationship, it's much wider than that. I mean, take for instance, the issue of uh, tourism. Uh, it's quite a healthy uh, relationship there as well. About 600,000 uh, South Koreans uh, came to Singapore, which makes them the 17th larger tourist uh, group that uh, comes here. Um, and um, um, and, you know, uh, about 100,000 Singaporeans went to South Korea. Now, th it's healthy, but it could be much bigger. Remember, uh, Singapore hosts 17 million tourists uh, from abroad. So 600,000 South Koreans coming here uh, from a country with a population as big as South Korea's. I think that's one room, uh, one area for, for improvement. Um, I think the other very big and important area is technology. Uh, South Korea's experience is one that uh, Singapore does look up to. Uh, Singapore is trying to go high tech. It's got a number of startups. And I think it's looking for the kind of ecosystem and the set of government policies that South Korea has fostered, uh, which have developed such an ecosystem and such a fantastic record of innovation. So apart from South Korean investments in startups, I think uh, Singapore is looking to learn from South Korea on how you foster and enlarge uh, technology. So I think they could do more there, both sides. All right, it's far more than just uh, trade and uh, financial investment. Uh, you, you must be aware of uh, Moon Jae-in government of South Korea's initiative, New Southern Policy. What do you make of Moon Jae-in government's uh, New Southern Policy in general? Yeah, so uh, this is an interesting policy and I think it's not very well understood yet in Singapore, so I think uh, Seoul has to do a better job of kind of selling it. But the accent of the policy, uh, as you know, is on the people sector. Uh, uh, the second P is prosperity. Uh, and the third is uh, peace. If you look at uh, trade between South Korea and ASEAN, I mean, it's running to $150 billion or more. Uh, only China does more trade with South Korea. So, you know, again, South Koreans may not understand this, but ASEAN is a very major player in South Korea's exports. And given your slightly shaky relationship with Japan these days, could be an even more important part of the relationship. Um, South Korea is also a very big investor in ASEAN to the tune of two, uh, sorry, $4 billion in 2017. Um, but that's not all. Uh, it's got a very healthy uh, tourism relationship. And... Um, President Moon has emphasized that prosperity doesn't just mean trade and investment and what's good for South Korea, but investing in the benefits to and prosperity of this region. And I think South Korea is increasingly uh, providing economic aid to the less developed countries. So, for instance, uh, coming up in a few days is going to be a South Korea Mekong summit where five Southeast Asian countries uh, that are watered by the Mekong River are going to meet and talk about sustainable development together, amongst other things. So I think, you know, this gives weight to his claim that uh, prosperity is not just about sort of South Korea uh, doing well out of trade and investment in this region. Um, I, I note, too, by the way, for the future, ASEAN 
uh, its economy is the size of India's. Uh, and it has a massive and growing middle class, perhaps bigger than India's. So I think for the future, there is a prosperity angle too, to of course, the relationship. The last P is peace. And here again, President Moon has quite interestingly said that this doesn't mean security alone. Uh, there is an ASEAN security dialogue with South Korea, but it also means building the larger uh, role of ASEAN in the possibilities for the Korean Peninsula in the future. If there were to be an agreement tomorrow on denuclearization with the North, I think two things stand out for South Korea with respect to what ASEAN can do. First of all, ASEAN has a very good record of engaging with countries like Vietnam and Myanmar, who were not very close at one point, who had their internal problems that ASEAN couldn't agree with, who had difficulties bilaterally, but ASEAN relentlessly, patiently engaged uh, them diplomatically. And by the way, North Korea has probably an older relationship with many of the ASEAN countries than South Korea does. There's an old, old uh, solid relationship there that ASEAN can work with. And the second is, if North Korea comes out of this nuclear problem, it has signaled already it wants to reform its economy. Who better to look to than ASEAN that has worked with Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, former communist countries such as Vietnam, very successfully uh, in the economic realm. So I think President Moon looks at this peace angle and ASEAN's role in it in a much more holistic sense. And I think that's what's, that's what's so fascinating. And I think, uh, therefore, I think, uh, you know, the new Southern policy, not so well understood perhaps in Singapore amongst ordinary people and in the region, but a very important initiative. Right. Uh, Professor Kande Prasada Abbasbhai, thank you so much for your rich analysis. Thank you very much for having me. It's been very interesting and uh, I look forward to, of course, uh, being on the show again uh, in the future. Uh, most definitely, Professor. Professor Kim, uh, your take on uh, Professor Abbasbhai's analysis. It seems like um, ASEAN countries are appreciative of the rich content and visions of the Moon Jae-in government's new southern policy, but it's not well advertised or understood. All right, and, and actually, the, uh, as he rightly the pointed out, the, I think there's some potential for the, mm. the working together as the, in realizing the three P's uh, uh, which are stressed under the new southern policies. Right. But uh, as he mentioned that uh, there, I think the three pillars, but there's a uh, different type of the, uh, the focus, the, the, in the effort uh, mm -hmm. need to be uh, taken. So for example, people to people exchange, I think, uh, shouldn't be a problem because the, the both parties are very, very interested in the mm -hmm. learning, the cultures and, the, mm -hmm. and, and so on. The second thing is that the, not only the first qualities, so it should be at the core first quality. So that means not only taking the benefits and from the trade uh, with the ASEAN, but at the same time, we have to consider that their, the well-being uh, of the, the peoples the, right, by right. providing some aid and so on. So that is yeah. the, what we have need to do more. Uh, then third thing is the peace. Then uh, I think uh, it has been considered that, that ASEAN is the, has the little things to do the, for the peace uh, process in the Korean Peninsula. But the, now the things change, as you observe that Singapore and the Vietnam has hosted the two important summits between the North Korea and the US. Right. And also for providing the continuous support for the peace process that is very uh, pivotal for the securing the, the stable condition for this the peace talk. Mm. So in that sense, the, we may ask the ASEAN to do some more active roles in the process of the peace, peace process. I see. Since taking office, the Moon administration has worked to elevate relations with ASEAN to the level of those with South Korea's four key neighbors, namely the US, China, Japan, and Russia. What could be reasons behind such efforts? Here's more on the story. South Korea's trade and diplomacy have long centered on its four key neighbors, the US, China, Russia, and Japan. In 2018, South Korea's largest export markets, in order of volume, were China, the U.S., Vietnam, Hong Kong, and Japan. As the global economy has slowed, there have been growing calls for South Korea to diversify trading partners away from the four major powers, with ASEAN being a viable alternative. The ASEAN economy has been growing at an annual rate of over 5% in recent years. The economic bloc is home to a dynamic demographic 
with 60% of the combined population under 35 years old. Meanwhile, the South Korean government selected Indonesia, its second largest trading partner in ASEAN, as a key partner in the new Southern policy and has worked to strengthen bilateral cooperation. South Korea and Indonesia pledged to boost bilateral trade volume to $30 billion by 2022. The two countries signed a Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, or SEPA, in October. SEPA will allow South Korean products, including steel, automobiles, and synthetic resin, to be exported to Indonesia without tariffs. The Moon Jae-in administration also looks to strengthen South Korea's ties with Mekong countries or the countries in the Mekong River Basin, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. Bilateral trade between South Korea and the Mekong region more than doubled from $34 billion in 2011 to $84 billion in 2018. People-to-people -people exchanges nearly tripled from 2.4 million people to 6.9 million during the same period. In particular, Vietnam is South Korea's largest partner in ASEAN in terms of trade, investment, and people-to-people -people exchanges. President Moon Jae-in has stressed the importance of ASEAN in diplomacy, saying the ASEAN Regional Forum, or ARF, which includes North Korea, is contributing to the peace on the peninsula. He is expected to drum up ASEAN support for his peace drive on the Korean Peninsula at the upcoming ASEAN-Korea Commemorative Summit. Well, it is no secret uh, that South Korea's diplomacy so far has been focused on four major powers in the region, the United States, China, Russia, and Japan. And New Southern policy of the Moon Jae-in government seems to elevate mm -hmm. South Korea's diplomacy, diplomacy uh, out of the box of four powers. Mm -hmm. uh, what were the limitations of this uh, diplomacy of South Korea focused on four powers? Right. Actually, dealing with uh, those major powers is not actually a favorable condition for those, the, the country like the, us, the, because the uh, simply lack of the powers mm -hmm. is not the comparable to the, those the, the superpowers. And so that thing is that uh, when we the shift our focus the, the beyond that the four major powers, that it would mean that we may depart from that the power politics. Uh, and two words to the norm-based international relations. Norm-based. Right, right. Okay. President Moon Jae-in is keeping a close eye on the role of ASEAN in his peace drive on the Korean Peninsula. How is this being viewed by experts overseas? Joining us on the line is Dr. Raman Paceco Pardo, Associate Professor in International Relations at King's College London. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. We are very pleased to have you uh, on this program. The ASEAN Regional Forum, or ARF in short, is a multilateral security institution involving South Korea, the US, and even North Korea. What can explain the international community's interest in the ARF? I think there are two main reasons why the international community has an interest in the ARF. Uh, first of all, it is a neutral venue. So it is a venue in which uh, the US, South Korea, North Korea, China, other countries uh, can discuss security matters uh, without uh, anyone leading the institution and trying to push one message or, or another. So in that sense, you can have uh, a very open discussion, uh, a discussion in which all views are going to be heard, including North Korea, which is not always the case. I think the second reason why this institution is so uh, popular is because it has been going on for a very long period of time. It has been going on for 25 years. And during this period of time, it, it has actually uh, served uh, countries to deal with their disputes. So we saw this in the 1990s uh, with uh, the rise of China. There were some disputes uh, taking place uh, in the East China Sea, in the South China Sea. Uh, these were dealt with, even though they were surfaced later on. When it comes to the North Korean nuclear issue, this was discussed in the early 2000s uh, with the Bush administration. During the Obama administration, there was also the opportunity to discuss this matter. And if you look, for example, at tensions between countries in Southeast Asia, uh, such as uh, Cambodia, Laos, for example, Thailand as well, this venue can be used to discuss these matters. 
But we might expect even more uh, contributed by ARF. Uh, what role do you think ASEAN can actually play in addressing North Korea's nuclear program, which is beyond the uh, Southeast Asian uh, regional you know, uh, area? So I'm expecting a member uh, mediator role from ASEAN. I think that ASEAN has uh, two important roles to play when it comes to dealing with North Korea. Uh, first of all, uh, I think it can serve uh, as a venue to facilitate dialogue uh, between uh, North Korea, the U.S., between, even between, maybe between North Korea and South Korea. So we saw this when the two previous summits between President Trump and Chairman Kim uh, were held in Singapore and then afterwards were held in, in, in Hanoi. I don't think that ASEAN can actually be a mediator. I don't think anybody wants a mediator between the two Koreas or between North Korea and the U.S., but it can certainly facilitate dialogue. And secondly, once uh, North Korea has reached an agreement with the US, we start to see some sanctions relief or sanctions ex exemptions. Uh, I think uh, certain ASEAN countries can serve as an example for North Korea about uh, economic reform, economic modernization, what the future might uh, look like. Vietnam uh, is an obvious uh, example here, but you could always point out that countries such as uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, which are more developed than uh, Vietnam, and not in the near future, but in the uh, not so distant future, let's say 10, 15, 20 years, uh, might be where North Korea would like to be then. So the economic example component, I think, is very important for ASEAN. I see. Professor Ramon Pachero Paparpardo at King's College in London. Thank you so much for sharing your analysis. Thank you. Professor Kim, any take on uh, the new southern policy of the mm -hmm. Moon government mm -hmm. so far? Mm -hmm. And how do you assess its uh, future? Right. I think this is a very timely, important policy uh, which you never seen the before. So uh, our approach is, I think the, the importance of the new southern policy is that is the, it provides some kind of the new vision for new the vision. bilateral relation between the ASEAN and Korea. So, uh, we need to go beyond that and market and oriented uh, the, the profit seeking mm -hmm. the relations or, uh, which used to be a, a kind of the, 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 the measure for the countering North Korea and so on. But now mm -hmm. we turn to the new era. So we need to go beyond, uh, need to go to, toward that uh, core prosperity and peace on the Korean Peninsula. Right. In the sense that we still have the many things learned from each other and lots of things to do together toward the peace and prosperity in Korean Peninsula. Yeah, indeed, they're pursuing not just uh, uh, prosperity, but peace, prosperity, and people All right. in a sustainable right. way. Yeah. Right. Professor Kim Young-jung, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. We look forward to the new roadmap of South Korea-ASEAN relations that the leaders of 10 ASEAN countries and President Moon will draw up in Busan on November 25th and 26th. And that's all we have for you on today's special episode ahead of the ASEAN Rock Commemorative Summit meeting. We'll be back next week. Thanks for watching.